Have you ever been told that your child cannot recover from autism? Yeah, me too. Yet today my son is no longer diagnosable with any of the symptoms he used to have. And sometimes instead of getting excited when they hear this, a parent will get defensive, as though someone's trying to change who their child is. And autism is not a who, it's a what. What is autism? The correct term is Autism Spectrum Disorder, or ASD, and it refers to a range of developmental conditions collectively characterized by similar traits like challenges with social skills, communication, and repetitive behaviors. And autism is defined as the Autism Spectrum Disorder, or ASD, because the symptoms range in severity. No two children are the same. If you are new to all this or reading about autism for a friend or a loved one, then let's begin with the basics. Generally, the symptoms of autism refer to difficulty processing emotions and a heightened sensitivity to external stimuli. No two people with autism have the same exact symptoms. It's an extended spectrum with one end being those who are higher functioning and the other being very low functioning. And the meaning behind functioning depends on their ability to navigate life. Some symptoms simply make life more challenging. You may have heard also the term Asperger's syndrome, and this term was actually described in 1944 by the Austrian physician Hans Asperger. In 2013, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, or the DSM-5, removed the term Asperger's and placed this diagnosis under the umbrella of autism spectrum disorders. Individuals who are high functioning may be able to go to school, talk to others, tolerate their sensory processing issues more easily than those who are low functioning. However, life is still much more complicated for them than someone who is neurotypical. They're usually unable to understand common social cues and struggle with communication. And people who have higher functioning autism may not even be known to others as someone on the spectrum. And most people are not educated in recognizing these signs. Higher functioning individuals can actually have more difficulties than lower functioning autistics because they're not readily known to have their challenges. They often get less help than lower functioning individuals with autism because their needs can offer often be missed and teacher by teachers and peers, and they can go undiagnosed for years or even a lifetime. Individuals who are low functioning with autism have many more challenges and some common symptoms, but not all, may be very little or no speech, inability to focus, anxiety, aggression, poor sleep, poor immunity, inability to dress or care for themselves, and they might even remain in diapers into adulthood. Isolation is really common for those with autism because socialization becomes really difficult at times and they tend to either choose to avoid people or not befriend, be befriended by others due to social awkwardness. They're just thought to be different but not known to have actual disabilities that prevent them from comfortably connecting with others and doing the day-to-day -day tasks that neurotypical people take for granted. Autism can make it difficult to understand others' actions or intentions and how to reciprocate in a calm and social fashion. They may internalize their anxiety or lack of ability to focus to others and seem lazy or defiant or just unsocial. And they're common to be seen as loners and they often are des often is desperate to make friends and have social interaction. So what is a diagnostic criteria for autism? Well, the DSM stands for, again, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, which is the manual published by the American Psychiatric Association. And the manual includes classification of psychiatric disorders for use by medical and mental health professional clinicians. And they may prefer to versions of the DSM or look for diagnostic codes at different disorders, examining criteria for diagnosis. About 25% of the disorders are specific to children and are in the section of disorders usually first diagnosed in infancy, childhood, and adolescence. Autism and related disorders may have been speci specifically included in different versions of the DSM since 1980. 
the latest edition of the DSM made significant changes to the diagnostic criteria for autism related disorders and the DSM-5, five separate diagnoses were classified under the heading pervasive developmental disorders, autistic disorders, Asperger's syndrome, pervasive developmental disorder, not otherwise specified, which is PDD-NOS, Rett syndrome, and childhood disintegrative disorder. The per pervasive development disorder category no longer appears in the DSM-5, and autistic disorder, Asperger's syndrome, and PDD-NOS have now been combined into one label called the Autism Spectrum Disorder. Also, you'll be hearing it referred to as an ASD. The criteria in the DSM-5 for diagnosing ASD include three listed deficits in social communication and social interactions. Clinicians must be sure that these characteristics are not due to developmental delay alone. To be diagnosed with autism or with ASD, an individual must meet all three of the following criteria. Difficulties in social, emotional reciprocity, including trouble with social approach, back and forth conversation, sharing interests with others, and expressing under and understanding emotions. Difficulties in nonverbal communication used for social interaction, including abnormal eye contact and body language and difficulty with understanding the use of nonverbal communication, like facial expression or gestures for communication, and deficits in developing and maintaining relationships with other people, other than with their caregivers, including the lack of interest in others' difficulties, responding to different social contexts, and difficulties in sharing imaginative play with others. The criteria in the DSM-5 also include demonstrating at least two of the following four restrictions and repetitive behaviors, interests, or activities. Stereotyped speech, repetitive motor movements, echolalia, or repeating words and phrases, sometimes television shows or from other people, repetitive use of objects or abnormal phrases. Also, rigid, rigid adherences to routines, ritualized patterns of verbal and nonverbal behaviors, and extreme resistance to change, such as insistence on taking the same route to school, eating the same food, or you know, be, because the color has to be the same, or repeating the same questions. The individual may become greatly distressed at small changes in these routines too. Highly restricted interests with abnormal intensity or focus, such as strong attachment to unusual objects or obsessions with certain interests, such as train schedules, increased or decreased reactivity to sensory input or unusual interest in sensory aspects of the environment, such as non-reactive to pain, strong dislike to specific sounds, excessive touching or smelling of objects, and a fascination with spinning objects. Under the DSM-5, ASD is now diagnosed by symptoms based on both the current functioning and past functioning of an individual. This new observational criteria will actually allow clinicians to diagnose people who may have shown some signs of in early development, but whose symptoms didn't really appear clear until adolescence or adulthood. In addition to the changes in criteria for ASD diagnosis, the new DSM-5 also has the severity rating. So new DSM offers ways to identify ASD levels of severity for each individual. And the three levels of severity include requiring support, which is level one. Individuals with this level of severity have difficulty initiating social interactions, may exhibit unusual or unsuccessful responses to social advances made by others, and may seem to have decreased interest in social interactions. Additionally, repetitive behaviors may interfere with their daily functioning. These individuals may have some difficulty redirecting from their fixed interests. And in level two autism, requiring substantial support, individuals with this level of severity exhibit marked delays in verbal and nonverbal communication 
Individuals have limited interest or ability to initiate social interactions and have difficulty forming social relationships with others. Even with support in place, these individuals restricted interests and repetitive behaviors are obvious to the casual observer and can interfere with functioning in a variety of contexts high levels of distress or frustration may occur when interests and behaviors are interrupted level three autism is requiring very substantial support this level of severity causes individuals with asd severe impairment in daily functioning. These individuals have very limited initiation of social interaction and minimal response to social overtures by others and may be extremely limited in verbal communication abilities. Preoccupations and fixed rituals and repetitive behaviors will greatly interfere with da daily functioning and make it really difficult for them to cope with any type of change and it's very difficult to redirect this person from those fixed interests. So do any of these sound familiar to you as a parent? Your, your child may already have a diagnosis and they may have told you where they fall at level one, two, or three. The good news is I have helped parents with level three autism, bring them down to level one, and even taken high level autism and gotten kids to where they they basically have no more symptoms of autism. And we're gonna to get to more of why this can be. First, I wanna say autism can be a symptom and not a, gut, not a diagnosis. So you might have wondered why some parents are able to recover their children from the symptoms of autism and others are just struggling with constant illness and behaviors, but don't even seem to ever improve. So if you're a parent of a child newly diagnosed with autism, but you haven't, you, you haven't found the answers you need, or you're a parent of a child with autism who has been searching for years to find the right solutions to help your child, but you're not getting the positive results you hope for, then stay with me because you're going to discover why persistent parents like you and me can get our children better faster, safer, and with less expense in the least amount of time why it's critical that you get all of the right resources in place right now. So my goal is simple, is to help you more easily bring your child to the healthiest outcome possible. Whether you're new to the autism journey or you've been on it for years, even decades, this episode can help you. The more you can truly understand and narrow down what you need to do and how to do it, the greater opportunity you'll have to experience your child living a better quality of life. First, you have got to believe that your child can get better, any amount of better. Every child's level of recovery is different, but all children can improve and have a better quality of life. Our goal is to help them live to their full potential, be healthier, and ultimately be happier. You may not have seen this before, so keep an open mind as we move forward. That's all I ask for your child's sake. The questions arise, what causes the symptoms of autism? Is it autism or is there something underlying that is causing symptoms in a child that are mimicking those of autism? The, this may really seem odd, like an odd thing to say, but there are there's so much truth behind it. Autism can really be a symptom and not a diagnosis. It can be a symptom of something underlying, such as toxins, pathogens, infections, a compromised immune system, inflammation on the brain. Lots of things cause the symptoms of autism, and it's never just one thing alone. The information, this may information, may completely be contradictory to what experts and non-experts you've heard in the past have said, such as friends and relatives that have told you before. Have you ever heard recovery isn't possible? And I like to say, you know what, tell that to my son. When my son was first diagnosed with autism, I was actually told to drug him, try behavioral therapies, and there was nothing that we could really do for him that, you know, but just manage his symptoms the rest of his life. And knowing life would be that difficult for him and the rest of our family, living with the symptoms of oppositional defiance disorder and OCD, sensory issues that made it difficult for him to even sit in a classroom, consistently getting in trouble at school, the inability to focus and concentrate in a classroom 
when we knew he was brilliant. Having difficulty sleeping, connecting with others, making friends, all of his digestive disorders, debilitating headaches and stomach aches that would wake him up at 3 a.m. screaming. So I began to do my own research to help him feel better, and I got a lot more. It took me a decade to figure it out, but today my son is no longer diagnosable with autism. He lives a happy, healthy, independent life, free of his once debilitating symptoms, and now I can share what I've learned with you as I have for over 25,000 parents worldwide who wish to help their children live to the highest potential. What are the symptoms of autism? So let's look at some of the symptoms of toxins, pathogens, and co-infections, which many mimic the symptoms of autism. Parents ask me all the time, Karen, why does my child do this? And they'll label some symptom. Why do they do this? Why do they do this? As if there's some you know, specific reason. And there may be because there are some underlying toxins and inflammations that contribute to specific behaviors. But again, it's never just one thing. The answer varies because any symptom is created again by the cause or causes and its effect on the brain. So there can be multiple causes and symptoms depending on where the body and the brain are affected by that toxin or organism and the inflammation they're creating. Leaky gut and candida, yeast is also, a, you know, candida is well known, right? It's, it's a living organism that can really attack, it, it attach itself to the wall of the intestines, creating holes that allow undigested foods and other toxins to enter the bloodstream. And this is known as leaky gut. Any food gets, any, if any food gets into the bloodstream intact, it can be very, very toxic to the entire system, especially the brain. This lowers resistance to infections and leaves us vulnerable to greater susceptibility of food intolerances and allergies created by the immune system who sees this new foreign agent to attack every time that food comes in when it wasn't a problem before. This is really something we see commonly in children with autism. These immune reactions of this sort cause the body continue, to continually fight for health when the immune system is constantly in the on position and it can become depleted, leaving us even more vulnerable to infectious diseases and autoimmune illnesses. And it also depletes the body's levels of the brain messenger serotonin, which contributes to anxiety, depression, and sleep disorders. Symptoms can include, but are no, in no way limited to, hyperactivity, an inability to handle emotions, aggressive behavior, brain fog, poor vision, missed sleep, constipation, diarrhea, rashes, OCD, memory loss, poor co coordination, and extreme fatigue. Now let's talk about heavy metals. There are four big ones lead, mercury, cadmium, and aluminum. First, I'll talk about lead. Lead's a heavy metal most commonly found in buildings built in or prior to the 1960s, although lead-based paint was not banned until 1978. It is found in lead-based paint in dust of these buildings and exposure is the highest for those who have lived in or visited older structures that have not been properly cleaned up. This includes schools of all kinds that our children spend countless hours in, breathing in the dust or getting it on your hands or in your mouth, even in minute, tiny amounts can cause lead poisoning. And it can also enter your body through a cut in the skin or a piece of lead as small as a grain of salt can actually poison you. Lead poisoning can come from things like the dust from old lead-based paints, soil, lead plumbing fixtures, newsprint, ceramic glaze, cosmetics, imported toys such as those from China, and in various types of jewelry. Lead can cross the placenta, which means pregnant women who are exposed to lead also expose their unborn child. Lead can damage a developing baby's nervous system. The Mayo Clinic actually states that children under the age of six are especially vulnerable to lead poisoning. Lead crosses the blood-brain barrier and even in small amounts severely affects the brain, kidneys, cardiovascular system, and the reproductive system. 
Lead easily passes through the placenta from mother to baby, directly affecting brain development. Because this can cause things like mental retardation, difficulty with visual motor coordination, and cognitive learning disabilities that can last a lifetime. Lead is also known to be a contributor to ADHD. It, is, it reduces iron and zinc in the body. It's needed for protection of the neurotransmitter. Uh, zinc is needed for the protection of the neurotransmitter dopamine, which is our feel-good chemical. It kind of helps give us that reward center, and it also helps us to, uh, to, to be able to focus and concentrate. Lead disrupts normal brain transmitters affecting memory and motor function, autonomic motor control in the brain, behaviors, and emotions helping to regulate violence, mood, sleep, and appetite. It also interrupts the GABA system, which we rely on to keep our brain signals calm. And when this system is disrupted, we commonly experience anxiety. Now, lead can go undetected, showing no obvious symptoms However, a child with a high level of lead in a system is more likely to fail the third grade due to learning disabilities. The heavy metal toxicity may be overlooked in these cases. Symptoms of lead to look for or lead poisoning, neurological problems, learning disabilities, depression, poor memory, problems with social engagement, aggressive and even violent behavior, gastrointestinal problems, constipation, diarrhea, nausea and or vomiting, poor appetite, weight loss, insomnia, excessive fatigue, hyperactivity, seizures, and anemia, to name a few. What about mercury? Those at the highest risk of mercury toxicity are those, toxicity are those with developing brains, such as fetuses, infants, and children. Males are also at a higher risk because testosterone enhances its neurotoxicity. Autism affects four times as many boys as girls, and hormones play a big part in this. The neurotoxicity of mercury is enhanced by testosterone, which is predominant in boys. Autism is sometimes labeled as an extreme male brain. Higher levels of estrogen in females, especially in the last trimester of, uh, of pregnancy and the first year of birth, it really helps to protect the brain. So girls have a little bit more, a lot more protection, and especially in a part of the brain called the hippocampus. Now the hippocampus is a part of the brain that helps regulate emotions and memory. Mercury amalgam fillings, dental fillings, release mercury into the body so a mother can pass it in utero to her child. And symptoms of mercury toxicity include, but are not limited to, excessive irritability and anger, timid behavior, depression, weakness, delirium, insomnia, apathy, impaired concentration, poor memory, abnormal motor coordination, suicidal tendencies, personality changes, obsessive compulsive disorder, and some of the biological effects of mercury can include things like lifelong immune deficiencies, resisting removal of pathogenic yeast or candida albicans, reducing antioxidant level, which retarding brain development by interfering with DNA and RNA function, promoting the production of inflammatory cytokines, which are essential in fighting viruses and many other things, disrupts protein digestion, can enter the area of the brain called the hypothalamus, which is responsible for metabolic function. This includes hormonal balance, including neurohormones. So things like hunger, thirst, body temperature, and a circadian rhythm affecting the sleep-wake cycle are affected. An injured hypothalamus can cause lifelong suppression of the immune system and weaken the adrenals and the thyroid. It can inhibit neurotransmitters, which are brain messengers, such as serotonin and dopamine and norepinephrine. And these are responsible for things like proper sleep cycle, the ability to manage mood and to be able to focus. Sound familiar? Aluminum. Aluminum reduces the phospholipids or fat structure of the myelin. Now this is the carrier messenger 
in, uh, of messages to our brain. So unfortunately, the brain holds onto aluminum and has a hard time letting go of it. So once in the brain, it distributes itself, but primarily affects DNA. So again, the genetic issues, it's DNA synthesis, controlling how the cells function. Aluminum depletes mineral absorption as well. Aluminum affects the following neurotransmitters, acetylcholine and the enzyme that breaks down acetylcholine, which is involved in learning and memory, norepinephrine involved in attention and focus, dopamine, the feel-good chemical, also involved in our ability to concentrate and focus, and serotonin, which affects mood, sleep, and appetite. The co-infections of autism. Now, these are the most commonly missed that I see in almost everybody's uh, protocols or they're worked with ineffectively. I promise you I have solutions that we work with naturally, safely, and thoroughly. The co-infections of autism are commonly missed and they include mold biotoxins. PANS, which is an acronym for Pediatric Autoimmune Neuropsychiatric Syndrome, Basically, this is when the immune system attacks the brain and it can cause extreme obsessional uh, OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, uh, anxiety attacks, and a lot more. Uh, Lyme disease, another one very, very commonly missed, and also parasites, very commonly missed and very commonly treated improperly. You can see that a lot of the symptoms of these infections overlap, but they also cause similar distress and must be treated properly or the results on your autism recovery journey will be minimal. Now mold is the most common symptoms to look for are neurological, pulmonary, visual dizziness and stiffness in the neck or uh, pain in the back of the head. Uh, also they can vary greatly. The chronic inflammatory response that this causes contributes to leaky gut, hormonal imbalances, intolerance to carbohydrates and gluten and dairy and sugar. Sound familiar? Chronic inflammation in the brain can cause behavioral problems, learning difficulties, lack of ability to focus, hormonal problems, and other symptoms might be wake exhausted, never really getting a good night's sleep. You feel like you've got chronic fatigue, flu-like symptoms, respiratory issues that are hard to take a deep breath, chronic pain in various parts of your body, stomach aches or pain, pituitary dysfunction, hormonal problems, trouble focusing and concentrating, language difficulty, learning disabilities, poor memory, anxiety, anger, depression, ADD or ADHD, hormonal imbalance, weight gain, poor blood clotting such as nosebleeds, chronic headaches, including migraines, abdominal pain in their GI, various GI problems, chronic candida, diarrhea, bedwetting, nasal infections, commonly staphylococcus, like a staph infection in the nasal passages. This often also drips down from the nasal passages into the mouth, which can, which can also contribute to tooth decay. So you might notice there's more issues with problems uh, with, your with your child's teeth. And this can come from various uh, 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 things that, that we're working on here with the toxins, co-infections, gut, not absorbing the minerals or the nutrition from our food properly. There's a whole regimen to this, which is very important. Also noticing if there's some extreme light, light or sound sensitivity or really poor vision or sinus problems. So some possible neurological symptoms to look for would be impulsivity, issues with learning and memory, trouble with fine motor coordination, reclusive behavior, lack of enjoyment in things that should be enjoyable, language trouble such as comprehending and articulating words, tics, obsessive compulsive disorder, depression, uh, anxiety and panic issues and atypical seizures, now, PANS, again, I talked about pediatric autoimmune or psychiatric syndrome just a moment ago. This is also associated with streptococcal infections, again, strep infections, where you might hear it referred to as PANDAS. An overactive immune system reaction commonly brought on by streptococcal infections or toxic exposure, pathogenic bacteria, viruses, inflammation, 
rapid detoxification too fast when you don't have the proper detoxification support supplements and things in place as you're you're trying to detoxify there's a very very specific sequence to all of this that i see when parents come into my membership program they miss these things so commonly with other people and we make sure that we go slow and that these support supplements are in place first before we do anything else because we don't want to set off a pan's flare so we want to keep it slow and simple one step at a time very important with support in place first because the body can't keep up with the amount of toxins being released at, because there's poor liver uh, work and the liver is our organ of detox organ of detoxification so with liver congestion and poorly working detoxification pathways this is really easy to trigger if you're doing things too too fast and you're not doing them properly in the right order some symptoms of PANS include a sudden onset, onset of obsessive compulsive disorder, very clingy and fearful behavior, new tics they might have developed, chronic fatigue, poor handwriting. Again, these are the ways that it affects the brain, so motor coordination, trouble sleeping, biting, overly emotional, abdominal pain, anxiety, and a lot more. Now let's talk about Lyme disease. Lyme disease is on the rise. It mimics many symptoms of autism and is commonly missed in tests. And Lyme is usually contracted through a tick bite, but not only ticks. Now it's mosquitoes, horse flies, sand, flies, sand fleas. And some of these ticks too can be as small as a poppy seed so they can really go unnoticed. Lyme can be passed again in utero from mother to child. And this is very important to know. And also that it can be passed through breast milk. So Lyme can also be passed again from mosquitoes and head lice and other things that our kids have other exposure to. Symptoms of Lyme disease, which can also mimic other disorders, attention deficit disorder, learning dif dif difficulties, Obsessive compulsive disorder, or OCD, depression, anger, and rage. Lyme gives like really, really rageful anger. Tantrums, increase in oppositional behavior, abdominal pain, headaches, night sweating, possible fever or flu-like symptoms, ur frequent urination, sudden onset of sleep disturbance, joint pain, neck pain, fatigue, difficulty breathing, dry cough, sole of foot pain, visual problems, poor balance, hand flapping, emotional withdrawal, irritability, reduced social participation, and red or purple stretch marks, usually around the, on anywhere on the body, but are often on the hips. And they look like, uh, like, a, like a purple stretch mark. Um, so, uh, you know, you might, you might notice somebody with these or your child or them on yourself or your child, not knowing where that, what they were. And this is Bartonella, which is a type of Lyme disease. It's a very common symptom of them, a physical symptom that we can see. Uh, other things are Bell's palsy with facial drooping. The next one, Alzheimer's. The next, schizophrenia, multiple sclerosis, chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, heart conditions. The next thing that's really important to know about are parasites. They're common in children with autism and can cause many his, his, you know, hysterical and behavioral issues, such as number one, one of the most common symptoms and very commonly overlooked to be a parasitic problem is chronic constipation. Another one is teeth grinding, hair pulling, sinus issues, craving sugar, itchy skin, anger, and really crazy type behaviors, brain fog, chronic fatigue, diarrhea, mouthing and chewing or drooling, hungry all the time because the parasites are eating the nutrition from the food that he eats. So his body is going to be hungry because it's craving the nutrition that it's not getting. So do any of these symptoms sound familiar to you for your child? Now, again, you can see they overlap many of them. This is why it's important to do A to Z and not just do one thing, one little detoxification or just diet, because those are important, but they are, they're not enough. And it's very, very important. The next piece I'm going to talk about is something that 
a lot of people are unaware of or really don't take seriously enough and it is a huge huge problem this is electromagnetic field radiation emfs electromagnetic field pollution okay a lesser thought of but incredibly power comp powerful component that is damaging our health today and the health of our children there are there's a prevalence of autism from mom's prenatal exposure to emfs due to the membranes and the organizational aspects of the womb so when a pregnant woman turns on her cell phone or puts it next to her body it gives a blast of electromagnetic field radiation to the fetus that is measured to be amplified by 20 times inside the inside the womb and then it is outside and this can contribute to issues of anxiety hyperactivity extreme fatigue memory epstein-barr virus cancer autism and much more the dangers of emfs need to be taken seriously and i have a free trial of an emf harmonizer to help protect yourself and your family available at the show notes on the show notes page for you which will be at naturallyrecoveringautism.com forward slash 206 because this is show 206. And so I've listed a quality resource for you and they offer a two week, 14 day free trial. Try it out for a couple of weeks. There's nothing to lose and it is so, so important. I have it on my phone. I have it on my husband's phone. I have it on both of my kids' phone. We have it on our home. We make sure that we are protected because this is bombarding all of us. So how do health issues contribute to the symptoms of autism? A study in the Journal of Neuroscience, which I will link to in the show notes, Gut Microbes and the Brain, Paradigm Shift in Neuroscience, found that alterations in the gut microbiome may play a pathophysiological role in human brain diseases, including autism spectrum disorder, anxiety, depression, and chronic pain. The gut directly affects the ability of the brain to function. Bacteria in the gut communicate with the brain and the neurotransmitters or brain messengers that are made in the gut. They can't do their jobs. They can't send the messages for regulating sleep, mood, appetite, uh, ability to focus. The gut also makes up 80% of the immune system. So the gut controls the brain and the immune system. Very important to remember this. So I, we start with the gut, but we don't end there, right? But it's a big piece. And as you've seen, the toxins and co-infections and everything also disrupt the gut. So sometimes parents might say, Karen, I've had my child on a, what I think is a good diet because I know there's a lot to diet, but they'll say, I think I've had my child on, child on a good diet for a long time, and, but their gut doesn't seem to be healing or they just don't seem to be, seem to be getting better. It's because there's more to this, right? All of these things are factors and there are a lot of commonly missed diet pieces as well. But all of these things really uh, directly disrupt the gut. Lime, mold, heavy metals, they also damage the gut. So all of them have to be worked with. We can do this naturally and safely, so no worries. So in my 18 years of autism research, recovering my son from his symptoms of autism, after being told it could not be done and working with hundreds of parents of children with autism, I have found that all people with autism have many biological health-related issues in common. These issues often include poor immunity and a predisposition to viral and bacterial illnesses and infections, toxic overload, a weak and leaky gut with digestive dif difficulties, so, you know, a bad microbiome, malnutrition due to poor absorption of nutrients, poor detoxification pathways, a higher sensitivity to environmental toxins, infections such as Lyme, mold, autoimmune issues, mycotoxins, parasitic infections due to weak gut and poor functioning digestion and more. As these biological issues are cleared, the brain can function at optimum and many symptoms disappear. For some, like my own son, the symptoms are all no longer present and the person is able to live a productive, healthy, happy, and fulfilling life. The life is very different from the one that they had before their health was restored. So this is what is important. 
The definition of recovery is to regain health. And by regaining health, many, uh, many people with autism symptoms can be greatly reduced so they can live a normal functioning and productive life. And for others, like my son, they can go away altogether. Everybody is different and everybody's level of recovery is different, but every child can improve. Autism is a biological issue. It's not a mental illness, and this is why autism can be recovered from. The definition of recovery, again, is to regain health. If we work with the causes of the health issues affecting their body, then we can restore health to the brain. Inflammation and toxicity are commonplace for people with autism, and they disable the brain from proper functioning. There are four stages to autism recovery that I discovered and I learned about in my 18 years of research and while recovering my own son. And they are, first, we want to go through healing the gut and balancing the microbiome in the gut. And this is much more than diet, but we definitely begin with diet, the right diet. But there are support supplements in place that, that help along the way. Stage two, we use natural, safe, heavy metal detoxification versus the pharmaceutical drugs that have a lot of negative side effects and allow for reabsorption of toxins as they're trying to be excreted. excreted. Uh, stage three, clearing the co-infections of autism, again, like mold, Lyme, pounds and strep, and parasites. And then stage four is brain support and repair. Now, once the toxins and inflammation are out of the way, you know an individual's real personality and their remaining needs for support. Because a lot of kids are in different therapies and parents are paying a lot of money for them. They're a, bit, a very big expense and take a lot of time. So what happens is if the brain is so toxic and inflamed in this process, right now while they're trying to do these therapies, there might, they might have poor success with them. They can be very hard on the child's self-esteem and you're spending a lot of time and money on things that aren't going to be able to be optimized. So doing these therapies afterwards, if necessary still even, are important. I've worked with people who had their children in speech therapy and then they came in and started working with me. They did the, went into my program, they went through the steps and then they had taken their child out of speech therapy, which they were spending $100 a week at. And they never had to go back to speech therapy later on because their child's speech came from working on these things I've talked about here. My own son, I had pulled him out because of therapies because it was not speech, but like more behavioral types of therapies and social. And they were so hard on him and it was just not working. And I finally pulled him out. And then I learned all of these things I learned that I, took me a long time. I could shorten that time for you because I now know it, but I had to be learning it along the way. And so once I worked with all of these things, my sons never needed to go back to therapy again. So we begin with the gut healing because it's paramount because it lays the foundation for stabilizing and assisting detoxification pathways, reducing inflammation and balancing the gut microbiome. All of this is done to strengthen the innate immune system and help restore the brain's balance. Speech, focus, sleep, irritability, uh, aggression, anxiety, sensory processing issues, muscle and motor function, vision, hearing, respiratory issues, hormonal balance, social connections, and so much more can be restored by working with these causes not just the symptoms. So how do you begin to recover from the symptoms of autism? Many parents ask for my help and I like to begin with the first step in healing the gut, which is diet. Yes, diet alone is very, very important, but as you know now, it's not enough, but it is definitely the first step. And I know children can be picky eaters, so it's a process of transitioning. Um, Autism recovery, again, is much more than that alone, um, which is why many parents also fall short of the optim optimum results and thinking that's all there is that they need to do because they just don't know everything. It's not a lack of commitment. It's really just not knowing, a lack of knowledge. Like I said, this took me 18 years of in-depth research and trial and error and experimenting with my own son to figure it out. And this is why I'm here for you today. 
So here again, we begin with a diet and then we move forward from there in a very specific sequence. Transitioning to the right diet foods can be very difficult, again, because the bad bacteria in the gut have overgrown and they've killed off a lot of the good bacteria in the gut. And that overgrowth of candida can cause toxicity and inflammation in the gut, therefore distressing the brain. So removing these foods that feed that bad bacteria is a first step. And there are a few specific foods that must be removed for a multitude of reasons. You can get my free guide to the top seven foods to remove from the diet to help reduce these symptoms of autism and explains the, the details all behind why they need to be removed and what they do. And I'll put the link in the show notes at naturallyrecoveringautism.com forward slash 206. But the quick link for you is also autismcheatsheet.com. It's really easy. Your child is, again, addicted to these foods because they contain sugars that the candida feed off of to thrive on. And many contain opiates. Dairy and wheat contain opiates like the opiate drug. So they're craving many of these and they want more. This transition can be really difficult because I know picky eating, the picky eating issue makes it really hard to transition away from the bad foods and into more of the good ones that help heal the gut and don't have the things that feed the bad bacteria. The process has to be done slowly. It's a transitional process, so be patient with your child and with yourself. One step in the right direction is a, strep, is a step in the right direction. Any type of movement in the right direction makes a difference. You are making a difference and you are the key to your child's success. Once the holes in the gut heal, <clears throat> the parasites are eradicated. The good bacteria are restored to balance and the heavy metals are detoxified and the co-infections cleared properly. Then the person's symptoms can reduce or even disappear altogether for some like my sons did. Now this doesn't mean an overload of the body with harmful drugs. There are natural and safe ways to do this ultimately for better, better mental clarity, sleep, communication, mood stability, ability to connect with others, a stronger immune system, and so much more. This all natural four stage process to naturally recover your child from their symptoms of autism for the optimum results possible is what I bring to you now. My 32 years as a craniosacral therapist, and that means that we work on the bones of the head to balance the brain. So I've been studying the brain for over a decade when my son was diagnosed 18 years ago. Uh, I had a lot of knowledge that the brain can and does heal, but I didn't know that much about autism, so I had to begin researching it. So I have 32 years in total of of uh, being a craniosacral therapist and now 18 years of autism research and what I did to recover my own son. This is why I am an expert in autism and it's what I will teach you in my free autism recovery workshop and how I can support you through this whole process. I know the isolation personally, I know the challenges and uh, you need support on this and you wanna be sure you're doing things correctly. Please watch my free workshop now. I will link to it in the show notes for you so you can improve your child's quality of life and they can live to their full potential. And that link is in the show notes for you now at naturallyrecoveringautism.com forward slash 206. I hope that this has been helpful for you. Please share it with a friend, share it with many friends, share it with your Facebook groups. There are so many parents searching for this information. They need the, the knowledge and they need the guidance and they need the support. And I have been through it, I've lived it, and I have the experience to help you if that's something you need. The free workshop will explain everything to you and how I help parents every day through this process. Again, they'll, that link will be for you and you can go, go watch it now. It, or, or go register for it right now is at naturallyrecoveringautism.com forward slash 206. I hope this has been helpful for you. I truly am here to help you to help your child live a better life and a life that they truly deserve. It's about being healthier, happier, and living to their full potential so that they can do whatever they want and live the best life possible. 
Thank you for what you're doing here as a parent, because again, you are the key to your child's success. And without you, your child would not have a chance. It is up to us as parents. We, as, as their parents, were given this opportunity to help them. And now uh, it's your choice to be able to move forward with this information and uh, be able to help them because now you know what needs to be done. And again, show notes one more time, naturallyrecoveringautism.com forward slash 206. Thanks for being here and I'll see you soon.